Hey guys and welcome back to another video. In this one we are going to take a look at the timeline node. Timelines are useful in a lot of scenarios. They allow us to output values over time based on a curve that is completely adjustable and gives us complete control over how we want to output our values over a period of time. For example, you can use it to animate objects in your level and control their scale, location and rotation. Now let me jump into this project to show you guys exactly what I mean. In this level, I have used the timeline node to create a couple of moving actors. The first one is this door here. As you can see when I hit the button, the door rotates around its axis and gives us a clean and smooth rotation for the door. The second one is these rotating robots. Their automatic back and forth rotation is made using a timeline node. And finally, this elevator works with a timeline as well. When I hit the button, it goes up and when I hit it again, it comes back to its first location. In these examples, the timeline node outputs values to the rotation and the location of our mesh. But as I mentioned before, you can use it for changing the scale of a mesh, color and intensity for a light, or whatever you want to give values over time and create a changing effect. So it's a very useful node and it's a very good idea to have a good understanding of how it works. In this video, I'm going to explain all the pins and their functionalities so you can get a grip on the subject and be able to utilize the timeline node in your projects easily. Okay, now let's create a blueprint and name it timeline example. Here, let's set up a simple system so I can showcase the timelines functionality easily. Here, I'm going to add a cube in the components tab and assign this material to it so it looks prettier. And then I'm going to play with its location. So here, I'm going to add a set relative location function for the cube. I want to move it 5 meters upwards, so let's set the Z value on 500 and then connect the function to the events begin play node. What happens here is that as soon as we play the game, the cube will go up 5 meters and we cannot see the movement. So I'm going to add a delay before the function and this way we can have, for example, 2 seconds before the function is called and we can see the movement. All right, let's compile and play. And yeah, as you can see, after two seconds, it goes to another place based on the values we give to the set location function. Okay, now what we want to do is to make the movement smooth and we want to be able to actually see it move between the two points. We don't want it to just simply snap to its new location. And this is where the timeline can play its role. In order to add the node, just right click type add timeline and here it is it basically has two main parts the first one is the pins here which i'm going to explain one by one and the other one is the timeline editor which you can go to by double clicking on the node it enables us to add and edit tracks in the timeline this is how we can control the values and output them over a time period before I explain all the different parts, let's add a vector track and set it up so I can show you what it does exactly. And then I'm going to come back and go through these guys one by one. Let's just add a vector track and then hide and lock the X and Y values so we can work with the Z value separately. Before we add keys, I'm going to put this value on 2. This is the length of our timeline, so when we put it on 2, it means that it will last for two seconds. Here I'm going to right click, add a key and set the time and value on zero. Then add another one, set the time on two and the value on 500. Then click these two buttons here to frame the keys properly and now we are good to go. Now in the timeline node, you can see that we have the track we made and we can use the values it outputs on every frame. Let's connect it to that location pin in the function and also connect our delay to the play input. Here you can see that the timeline is working and this way we can have a smooth movement for objects in our level. 
Now let's go back and see exactly what is happening and how it works. Here you can see that we have two main outputs. The update runs on every frame, meaning that on every frame it outputs the value based on the track we made. For example, here at 0 0.5, it outputs 125.32 and the location will be set based on this value. Here at 0 0.93, it sets the value on this number and the location will be set based on this value here. This happens until the end of the track and then when the track is finished, the finished output gets activated and that's it. So for example, if we had a print string here, we can see that the function is called after timeline is finished. All right, now let's take a look at the other tracks that we can use in the timeline. The first one is a float track. This gives us a single value which can be used a lot. Actually, we can do the thing we did here before using a float instead of a vector. Here, I'm going to add two keys like the vector track we made before and set the values like the previous keys as well. The first one was 0, 0 and the other one was 2 and 500. Okay, now you can see that we have it here. And if we connect it to the location pin in the function, it will automatically convert the float to a vector. But the problem here is that it is using the value for x, y, and z at the same time. And it makes it move like this. So here, in order to make it work correctly, we just need to hit this split struct pin and then connect the float track towards that value. Now you can see that it's working properly and it's exactly like having a vector track with a z value and connect it to a vector pin. Here we have two other ones. The next one is an event track. This is pretty much self-explanatory. Just add a key in the timeline and this gives you an event you can work with. For example, let's add a key here around one second and then connect it to a print string. When the time hits the key, the event will be triggered and here you can see that our print string function is called. And finally, we have a color track. This gives us different colors and, for example, can be used for changing light colors. Here, let's add a point light and place it under the cube. Let's also bump up the intensity so we can see it easily. And then using a color track, we are able to change the light colors. Just make a color track and create a couple of colors using these keys here. You can right click, add a key, and then change the color to whatever you like. Now I just need to set light color function for the point light and then plug in the color track we made. Before playing the level, I'm going to check this loop option here so that it creates a loop for my timeline and repeats the track when it's finished. You can see that when I enable it, this icon shows up and tells us that this timeline is on a loop. Let's also disconnect the set location function for now so it doesn't move and then play the game. Yeah, as you can see, it's changing the light colors based on the track we made and it's also on a loop, so it repeats itself and creates a loop for us. Here we also have this add selected curve asset. This enables us to choose a curve from somewhere else and bring it here. But honestly, I have never used it and I think you are not going to need it either. You can always make the curve you need here using these tracks. We also have two useful options here. This autoplay means that the timeline will be played as soon as we play the game. So it's like connecting the timeline to an event begin play node. We have this loop here as well, which we used before, and it's actually a pretty useful option to have. The final thing worth mentioning here 
in the timeline editor is that you can play with the curve and control the movement of the object by adjusting it. For instance, we can select these two keys by holding control and clicking them and then right click and set them on auto. Now we have this curve, which means that at the start and at the end of the timeline, the movement will be a little slower compared to the middle of the timeline. And this way we can have a smoother movement for our object. Here, as you can see, the speed is changing based on the curve we made and it slows down at the end of the movement. All right, the final thing that we should know about are these pins here. We should use them based on our needs in each case and they are also pretty easy to understand. Play means it will play the timeline from wherever it is, but play from start means that it will play the timeline from zero, regardless of where it is right now. We have the same concept for reversing the movement, meaning that if we use a reverse, it will reverse the timeline from wherever it is. And if we use a reverse from end, it will jump to the end of the timeline and then goes backwards. Using the stop pin, we can stop the timeline whenever we want. And with the set new time pin, we can jump into different times in the timeline by setting a new time here. Okay, now let me enable giving inputs so I can demonstrate this by pressing a key on the keyboard. I'm just gonna add the enable inputs and then a get player controller. And now we are able to give input to the blueprint. Here, let's add the E key. And now, for example, if I connect it to the play from start, it will jump to the start of the timeline and play again when I press E on my keyboard. If I connect it to reverse, it will reverse the movement immediately. If I use reverse from end, it goes to the end of the timeline and then moves backwards. Stop is obvious. It just stops the timeline, so no need to show that. And finally, if I use set new time and set the time, for example, on one, it will jump into the time we set for it and goes on from that point. The final item of the timeline is this direction output here. It simply gives us the direction of the movement of the track so we can know whether it's going forward or backwards. To showcase what it does, let's connect it to the print string. And now you can see that it can give us the direction of the track. I don't use it often, but sometimes in different scenarios, you need to know the direction and use this data to make your logic. And this helps you do that. All right, now that you know all the items about the timeline node, you can understand how it works and everything should make sense for you now. So let's go to the other project and see how it's being used for different functionalities. For the door, you can see that it's set up exactly like what we talked about. We have a set relative rotation for the door static mesh and here using a float track which goes from 0 to 90 in one second, we can create a door mechanism for our game. We also have a flip-flop node here, so when we hit the key again, it reverses the timeline. Here by pressing E on my keyboard, I can easily open and close the door. The next one is the robot. It's using the same concept, but here instead of a set relative rotation, I'm using set actor rotation. But there is no significant difference here and it does the same job. The only thing here is that I want to make a loop so it goes back and forth. I'm using two timelines and as soon as the first one is finished, the other one starts. And then again, the same process will repeat and create a loop for us. Here I have added delay nodes before the timelines start. So the robot stops for one second and then starts again. 
which makes the movement look more natural and realistic. I wanted it to start from minus 50 degrees, so I use this set action rotation function here before the timeline starts. I also have a boolean here, and what it does is that it checks whether the character is alive or dead. I wanted the robot to stop after it hits our character, so I use this boolean. When our character dies, the boolean changes to false, and then nothing is attached to the false output here, so everything will be stopped, and we do not have any movement anymore for the robot after we are dead. Lastly, here we have the elevator which works like the door. Here, instead of a set relative rotation, we have a set relative location and we have a vector track with a value for the z-axis. We also have a flip-flop and a sound for the movement, so when it moves, we have a sound as well. Yeah, and that wraps it up. This is all you need to know about the timeline node to be able to use it efficiently in your projects. I hope you learned something new from this video and enjoyed this tutorial. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time.